Hey, the name's Cruel. That's King Rob Rule, and welcome to my Sunbreak Combat Tips video. In this video, I'll be showing off some of the new features in Sunbreak that will help you in your hunts. This guide will be using the Switch controller as a main to explain inputs, so refer to button placements on your given controller if there is any confusion. Just to clarify, this will be a generalist guide and not weapon specific. And now that's out of the way, let's get right into it. My first tip is to do with switch skills. You may be familiar with the ZL plus X plus A combination of buttons to swap between scrolls. However, what you may not know is that you can actually swap scrolls via the D-pad menu. From the default position on the D-pad menu, just press left on the D-pad and you will notice the flag icon for the scrolls becomes available. From here, you can simply press up or down on the D-pad to switch between scrolls. Personally, I find this far less cumbersome than the three button combo, but mess around with it and see what works for you. Also, if you find all the text for switch scrolls on the screen a little too cluttered for you, you can remove it by going into the menu, selecting game options, the HUD display, and unticking the box for switch skill info. You can also remove whatever else you want to from here as well. Next up is the marionette spider. These are the new endemic life forms that allow you to launch monsters into walls. So once you've collected a marionette spider, select it on the item wheel, aim your reticle with ZL and press Y to use it. You can also shoot it without aiming with ZL, but it's far less reliable and I don't recommend it. Also, make sure you are already close to a wall or a solid surface, or else you may not get a knockdown when launching the monster. Once the string has connected, face in the direction you want to launch the monster, ideally as close to a wall or obstacle as possible. Then all you have to do is press Y again and the monster will be launched. If you are successful, the monster will topple and you will be able to damage it without interruption for a while. That's basically it for the marionette spider. I think this is a good segue into talking about the new buddy abilities. Now I know this is a combat guide, but I do want to quickly mention the new Palamede abilities that are not necessarily combat related, but will help you a lot. If you're using a Palamede, there is a new ability right out of the gate for them called Sniff em Out. You can find this option via the D-pad menu. This ability allows your dog to search and mark the map for any item you have found at least once. This is especially useful for finding marionette spiders on the map but is also great for spirit bird routes and other gathering opportunities such as bone piles and mining outcrops. On top of that, Palamutes have another passive ability that pairs with this well, which is essentially an additional item pouch. This allows you to store more items than you can normally hold while gathering with your Palamute. This is great for mining runs when you are farming money, but it is also useful for gathering additional crafting items and consumables like null berries and honey that you may already have a full stack of in your item loadouts. There are more Palamute skills unlocked later in the game, but those are the ones I thought that were worth mentioning early on. So now I'm going to move on to the Palico abilities. So the Palicos have new secret support skills that are pretty OP. To unlock these, you will receive side quests at MR2 to complete three quests with each type of Palico. Each of these will unlock a new secret support move. Once you have completed these quests, you can assign the new support skills at the Buddy Dojo. These new skills include the Healing Clover Bat, a Meowsing Mist, Feline Powered Up, Feline Fireworks, and Lottery Box. I encourage you to try them all to see what fits with your playstyle best, but for me personally, I just can't go past the lottery box. This skill will randomly generate a support move, but it has a high chance of activating a Kittenator. Yes, you heard that correctly. The devs have officially created the most Monster Hunter feature of all time by pairing cats and Dragonators together. Essentially, the Palico sets up a mini Dragonator, and if it hits the monster, it will deal 300 damage and almost always a topple. Plus, the cat will always shout out, Where's my Kittenator? And who can resist that? Anyway, let's move on. Next up are the new Wirebugs, the Gold and the Ruby Wirebugs. The Gold Wirebug allows for extra drop materials when Wyvern riding. Normally, without a Gold Wirebug, you can obtain up to 3 drop materials while striking the target monster while Wyvern riding another. However, while holding a Gold Wirebug, you can get up to 6 items from one Wyvern riding counter. Also, if you have already collected 3 dropped materials from a regular Wyvern ride earlier, upon collecting a Gold Wirebug, you can collect 3 additional drop materials upon a second Wyvern ride encounter. 
While this is an awesome ability for farming materials, you must be strategic about when you pick up a gold wire bug, because just like green wire bugs, when you pick them up, they are only available temporarily. So only pick one up when you are sure a Wyvern ride will be available soon. Since this is a timed effect, ending a Wyvern ride does not result in you losing a gold wire bug, so long as you are within the time limit of the effect. This way, you can Wyvern ride multiple times to gain the most materials possible. Now for the Ruby wire bug. The Ruby wire bug simply allows for mounted Punisher moves to do more damage than normal. There's not much more to say about it than that. The same rules apply for the ruby wire bugs as green and gold, that is, they are also temporary in effect. Another handy tip for gold and ruby wire bug use is that if you're playing in multiplayer and you're not sure who on the team has a ruby or gold wire bug, you can check next to their player name, which will indicate a flashing gold or ruby wire bug if they are holding one. This way, when a monster becomes mountable, you can check who on the team has one. If a teammate has a gold or ruby wire bug and you don't, you can allow them to mount it. Speaking of wyvern riding, there are new ensnaring life available on walls called starburst bugs. When wyvern riding, you can launch monsters into these starburst bugs to deal more damage and inflict elemental blights. Sometimes these starburst bugs have an elemental property on them by default, but you can also influence the elemental blight they take on by striking them with an elemental weapon. That is, striking them with a thunder weapon will give them the thunder element, and striking them with, say, a water element will have them take on water element, etc. As a refresher for the effects of elemental blights, fire blight causes damage over time to the monster and causes it to flinch more, Water Blight makes the monster's body softer and weaker. The effect is stronger the harder the body part of said monster. Thunder Blight causes any kind of hit to cause stun damage, and KOs can be achieved extremely easily by attacking the head. Ice Blight causes the monster to move slower, but doesn't work on already exhausted monsters. Personally, I try to go for Thunder Blight most of the time because it usually results in another KO, allowing for another topple shortly after the initial topple of a Wyvern ride. You can also use the Marionette Spider to launch monsters into Starburst bugs, so make sure to take advantage of that if you can. In Area 3 of the jungle, if you lead the monster into the water, Spear Squid can run into the monster, causing some nice damage. Just be aware that they can cause you to flinch as well. In the cave of Area 8 of the jungle, there are creatures on the walls called Slicer Crabs that will shoot at monsters in the area. You can set up a trap right in front of them to get the maximum effect. Next up are some of the new environmental traps. On the jungle map, there are boulders hanging by vines in Area 1 of the map. By throwing kunai at them, you can cause the boulders to fall down, and if you've lined it up well, hit the monster for big damage. Potentially, it can also lead to a topple. On the Citadel map, there are a couple of environmental traps you can take advantage of. For example, there is a pool of resin in Area 13, where if you lead a monster into it, they will become stuck for a while and allow you to attack for a while without interruption. Thorny Toads are also found in this area, and they can attach to monsters, causing them to flinch. If you attack the Thorny Toads while they are attached to the monster, you can cause knockdowns. There is also a poison tree in Area 10 that causes poison to the monster, but it is also a double-edged sword because you can easily be poisoned by walking near it. Thankfully, the poison effect doesn't last long after walking away from it. Also, in Area 4, there is a building that can be knocked down and provide random items such as barrel bombs and healing items. It can be knocked down by launching a monster into it, but sometimes monsters will just knock it down on their own. And that's basically it for my generalist combat tips for Sunbreak. If you have any other suggestions or anything that I may have left out, be sure to leave it in a comment down below. If I get enough, I may make another video in the future including them, and if not, I'll just leave a pinned comment down the line. Anyway, I hope you found this video useful. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you did, and if you could share it with a friend, that would be even better. I've been King Rob Rule, and I'll see you in the next video. See ya!